I want you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew 22. I'm going to read you two passages of scripture. Can we read the Bible? Isn't it good to read the Bible? It is active. It is living. It is sharp, sharper than a two-edged sword. It gives me hope. It gives me strength. It gives me my purpose for the day. It is my daily bread. You should be reading your Bible daily. Matthew 22, we're going to read in verse 34. The title in my Bible, I am reading from the NIV. I'll jump around, but I'm reading in the NIV, and it said, at the title, it says, The Greatest Commandment. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, now Jesus has just, now that, that I, I don't want to skip over that. So these were the religious folk. And basically what that just said is Jesus shut them up. They were trying to question Jesus because they were trying to find something on him so that they can persecute him because they thought that he was teaching something false, but he was just teaching who he was. He was the Messiah. He was the Son of God. But they didn't know. They knew religion. They didn't know him. So they thought that they were trying to catch him with his works undone, but Jesus shut them up real quick. Listen, don't argue with religious people. Don't argue with religious people. It don't, it, it don't make no sense. You know who Jesus is. Okay, so he signs the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest command. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. I don't want to jump ahead, but let's go to first. I'll come back. But let's go to first John 4 and 7. First John 4 and 7. Y'all make sure I can see that clock back there. I don't want to get in no trouble. I'm already ticking. First John, I'm going to move for the sake of time, but First John 4 and 7, it says on the, the title, the header of this says, God's love and ours. Dear friends, I'm going to start in verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, but God is love. Say, God is love. This is how God, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one, he didn't have a backup, and only son into the world that we might live through him. My God, this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. So God, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it is truly a light unto our feet. So I prayed for me, but God, illuminate your word. Wrap it around the hearts of your people. Cancel every thought that does not align to it right now. And God, just truly, truly be God. In Jesus' name, can I get an amen? I just want to show you something, and then I'm, I want to get into my intro. Um, but back.
back in Matthew 22, as I was reading, there was something that jumped out to me, and I just want to, I want to read that. I want to look at that real quick. It's interesting to me that it says Jesus replied to them to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. He actually was answering them in the, in the Old Testament because he, Jesus, I don't know if you knew this, but Jesus knew the whole Old Testament. He was the word, but he, he is the word, but he knew the word. Okay. And so when they were trying to catch him with his works undone, Jesus spoke to them in the language that they understood because they, the Sadducees, Sadducees and Pharisees, knew the Old Testament. So he's like, let me put this trump card. I don't play cards, so I'm going to mess this up. But let me put this trump card down. Y'all think I don't know? And what you're exhibiting, and actually he was calling them out, what you are exhibiting is not love. You ain't even, what you're asking me about, you don't even live. And so I, I just, you have, I want to employ you, read the word. It will become illuminated to you. I gave honor to my husband, but guys, I just also want to say that y'all need to pray for Pastor Brian. I wonder what y'all thinking he needs prayer for. He needs prayer because guess what? I'm a lot. <laughs> I, can, I inaugurated myself in, my, in his life as the fun person. He's organized, he's disciplined, and I go with the flow. I feel like God has sent me to his life to be a helpmate, to make him fun. Because without me, life would be boring. And so oftentimes, I will have belly laughs and jokes that will crack me up, sometimes at the expense of him. A lot of times making racial jokes about his skin complexion and tanning and suntan lotion. And I will find myself on the floor laughing. So y'all need to pray for him. But even when I do that, he still loves me. It's crazy. Like, and he knows me, like he le like legit, like he knows everything about he's seen me at my worst he's seen listen ladies he's seen me giving birth i remember one time and i'm not gonna stay here long but i remember one time i was giving birth to our first child miranda and we were young and we didn't have any kids and this was his first time and i had done all the studying and he was scared by it all so he didn't do nothing and so i'm coaching him through it as i'm laboring and i'm there breathing <laughs> And he's looking, and then I look over, and his face is all scrunched up. And I'm like, why is your face scrunched up? You ain't in no pain. <laughs> and he looked at me, and I will never forget it, because I almost jumped out of the bed and strangled him. He said, your breath stinks. <laughs> let, let me tell you, fellas, there are a couple things that you do not say to your wife why she's pregnant, okay? Number one, your breath stinks. Number two, you look a hot mess. She might kill you. He said that, and I was like, no, you did not. Just give me a mint. Help a sister out. Sitting there suffering. He goes, my, I almost lost an eyebrow. I'm like, okay, that's it. If you don't, I'm going to. But, I, I, but honestly and seriously, I mean, that really did happen. I'm not exaggerating. I'm just grateful that he, even in that moment, loved me and knew me and accepted me fully. He wasn't judging me. He was trying to protect me in that moment from hurting my feelings. He's my safe place. He's been my safe place. I have friends 
that I love and I've done life with that I've allowed to see the innermost, most intimate parts of me. And I can say honestly that I live a life where I feel fully known and loved. I don't have to hide. I don't have to put on fig leaves like they did in Genesis to hide myself from the people that I do life with. But I also realize that there are many people, a lot of you in the room, that you don't have that or you don't realize that you don't have it, uh, that you have it. For many of you, you don't feel like there's a safe place for you to truly be you. That if you showed people the real you, no, like the real you, the one that doesn't always act as Christian-like as you should, the one that struggles with that lust, that same-sex attraction, the one who, who desires and covets other people's spouses, if people knew that part of you, they wouldn't like that part. So many of you, you kind of live a life in your normal life on social media. You put all your makeup on and you, put, you get your hair done and you, you're showing your engagement and your baby bump, pictures and all the highlights and nothing really real. And even when you try to show real, it's still real to, it's still real to relative. And it's sad because God never intended us to live like that. It's interesting that um, Romans 5 and 8 says that God demonstrated his love for us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. That implies that God knew that I was going to mess up and still love me enough to send not a spare, but his only son to die for me. So that says to me that he knew me and still thought I was worthy. He loved me and thought I was worthy. God knows you. He loves you. I could feel it in the room. Because I hear the enemy right now just whispering to you, but he don't know this, or you don't know this, or you don't know this, and you don't know this, and you don't know that, and da 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 And for even some of you, it's just like, I know this. I know that God loves me. He knows me. That God knows me the best. He loves me the most. I'm his favorite. I know that. I know that. I know that wild kind of love. I went to bear. I'm good. But my question to you then is, then why don't you live that way? You may touch that place on occasion, but do you have the consistency in your life to, to show that love? When storms come, when waves rise, when you don't get what you want, that God doesn't show up when you want him to. Do you still live that way? Or do you default into your old pattern and saying, well, God, you didn't show up. God, you didn't do it. You didn't heal them. I prayed, I fasted. You didn't do it. But he did. Whether they're healed here or in heaven, God had a plan for their life. Many are our plans, but it's God's will that will prevail. So why don't we live it? Well, Jesus said here, remember John, Jesus said here, well, the greatest, in Matthew 22, well, the greatest command is to love others as we love ourselves. I, I, I hate to tell you this, because 
a lot of you, just like Dr. Amanda and Dr. Kobe when they were here, and they tore us up, ladies, and they told us that we were dragged up and tra traumatized, and we had generational trauma, and we need to do something about it. If the greatest command is to love others as we love ourselves, I have to tell you that we can't love others if we don't love ourselves. We can't love ourselves if we don't know the one who loves us the most. And we can't understand God's love. We can't know God's love without knowing God because God is what? He just doesn't do love, he is love. So I have to tell you that everything that you do, how you love, how you live, I mean, how you love, how you live, flows from your ability to know that God loves you. And many of you, it's interesting because we've been walking around feeling like that we've been giving people love. I love people, but your love is superficial. Your love is based upon your flesh. It's conditional. God's love is not like that. God said, God didn't say love them the way to how you love. God said, love as I, love the Lord your God and love others as you love yourself. So love the Lord your God means I then in turn find love in the Father. Then I can love myself. And then from that place, I can then know love others. So if you don't have an understanding of God's love and you are trying to love, then where is it coming from? Just think for a moment, if all of the believers of Nikeo Church knew that they were fully known and fully loved by God and lived fully known and fully loved, what would Charlotte look like? Many people don't wanna know our God because us Christians can be stank and phony and stuck up and and exclusive and not generous and uh, not, not Nikeo. I'm not talking about Nikeo. Because God has given, and it's crazy because God gave us the greatest gift of love, demonstrated through giving his son, but yet we require others to do so much more. We make people jump through hoops. But you know why we do that? Because we're broken. And instead of just saying, God, I need you to heal me, we adjust to our old patterns, justify it by manipulating the scriptures, and then just go about and then just say, Lord, just it's them, it's them, it's them. That's, it's not me, it's them. But God dealt with you first. Love the Lord your God. Love yourself. Love others. So let's talk about real quick. What are some of the hindrances to knowing God and his love? I'm sorry, is this hard? I don't want when Pastor Tamika comes up, y'all are like, oh gosh, she's about to slap us around. Y'all okay? I love, like, seriously, I love y'all, but this is what the Lord told me, and I'm obedient to God because I don't think fish smell works on cute. So I'm not trying to be in the belly for y'all. I'm gonna do what God told me to do, okay? I'm gonna do it with love because I love y'all because God loves me and I know it, and I love myself. Look at me. I love me. I like me, I'm fun. I'm the best person I could be with. Y'all can say that self-centered, but it's rooted in God's love. 
It ain't rooted in my self-love for myself. I know that God loves me, and that's enough. So what is the hindrances to knowing God and his love? Number one, this is going to hurt. I, I know it, it hurt me. We entertain the foolishness of the world. We try to incorporate a worldview into our biblical view. You know, we all know what a worldview is. We hear about it. A worldview is when the world defines your reality, your decisions, your choices, your whys, your ways, rather than God's word, his truth. You build your life there. How does that look? Okay. Here, yeah, this is the example that God gave me. Don't get mad at me. Y'all want to get, I wouldn't get mad at God. That don't work, but don't get mad at me. But we also then try to manipulate the scriptures to fit the worldly, fleshly ideals we have. Let me just say, let me just tell you about this. Okay. So I want you to write this down for the sake of time. Matthew 7, 24 through 27. It's foolish to not build your life on God's word. It's foolish. That's what that passage talks about. It's foolish. To build your, your life, to formulate your life on a, on a worldview is foolish. But we do do it. And I'm going to show you how. This is one of the examples God gave me. You believe that witches are demonic. We all believe witches, witchcraft, magic is demonic, right? It's demonic. It's witchcraft, right? It's in the Bible, right? Galatians 5.19. It's there, right? But we let our children listen to Beyonce, Taylor Swift. We let them go to the magic store. We let them play with um, the... Uh, we go and get we, get, we get stones and talk to, we use honey pot and the lady's talking about her ancestors and how they're with her. And we get, let our kids play with demonic toys and watch demonic shows. But we believe, but we believe, right? but that's not gonna hurt them, they'll be fine. I've prayed, I've declared, and I decreed that no harm, no dare. I've played the blood of Jesus. You manipulate the scripture. God says it's demonic. It is an act of the flesh. And he says in Galatians 5.19, let's read it. Let's read it. At the, let's read the 21, 21. It goes through all the things. And the end of 21 says, and I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now listen, I am not unsaving you. That, I'm not doing that. But the word says, if you indulge in these things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. There is, a, there is something in the kingdom that you can't get to. But my kids, they wanna have fun, they wanna be normal, later for normal. We need Esther's and Daniel's and David's. We don't need normal. The devil ain't playing. They are trying to take your kid. They are trying to impart their worldly view into your children. No, we don't celebrate no Halloween. My kids will tell you, you ask them. I don't listen to that, it's demonic. I don't wear an evil eye to bring good things. It's demonic. So that will hinder you from knowing God and his love. Number two. Bad representation. What does that mean? Your family, pastors, leaders, Christians. The way many people turn that don't want to know God is because of us. They don't even know God. They only know God through us. That's what the Bible says. They will know him through us. 
So we have God on us. You wear a cross, you play your music at work, but then you're stank. You're in your family and you're talking about it. The Bible says, don't let any unwholesome talk call them out of your mouth. Only what's useful for the upbuilding of the believer. Let your words be laced with grace and salt. But you go to your family reunion and you talk about your aunt. You talk about y'all, oh no, but you're just processing. You talk about your boss, you talk about your coworker. Oh no, I'm just, I just need to kind of process and kind of like, um, I just wanna just, am I in the right place? No, you just want your flesh to get rid of what you feel. I've been there, don't, don't, I'm not judging you, I've been there. I was in the gym just lately, I work out Monday, Wednesday and Friday, I gotta go y'all, we gotta go. Oh, I'm gonna really be in trouble, but I was in the gym recently and the ladies were in there and they, hey ladies, if you're watching, I'm not gonna name you. I have a special gym that I go to and they were talking and one of the older ladies and she grew up Catholic and she um, is knowing, getting to know the things of God and all the rest of us have kind of been saved for a long time. So she's a new believer. And so they're talking and they're talking about the politics at their schools and da 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 da. And I'm like, mm, no she didn't. Uh, that's a mess. Uh, and, then, and she goes, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. <laughs> and immediately, the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And you know what I did? Lord, I'm sorry. And I shut my mouth. Because that ain't none of my business. And if we want something to change, you know what you need to do? Talk to God. All right, I'm gonna go through this. How, we, how do we, okay, those were the hindrances. You ready to know how we do know God? Okay, how do we know God? We know God through Jesus. <laughs> he is the only way. He is the way, he's the truth, he is the light. He is the word. Let me read this, John 17, 20. I'm not gonna read the whole passage for the sake of time, but I want y'all to, to do some homework. I want y'all to read these scriptures. Jesus is here, this whole passage, Jesus is praying. He's setting everybody up. He's like, I'm about to be out of here. It's, it's time for me and about, I gotta go. I've done everything that I'm supposed to do. Now I gotta do the greatest thing I, ha I have to do. I gotta get on the cross. But before I do, I'm gonna pray for y'all. So John 17 is Jesus praying. Listen, if I'm Jesus and I know I done went through the garden, I done had to deal with all these folks, I had healed all these people, the last thing I'm thinking about is I'm praying for y'all. Like, God, you got it, right? Like, I'm giving my, like, seriously, but no, he took, he took time to pray. So what did he say? And I'm gonna read the, this is how we know, this is, this is what Jesus said. I'll start in 20. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, talking about believers, that all of them be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory. Listen, I have given them, he's talking about us, the glory that you gave me. That they may be one as we are one. Guys, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those that have given me to be with their, where I am to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you. They know you that, they know that you sent me. I have made you known to them 
and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Only way to know God is through Jesus. Now he said, I made, him, I made you known to them, talking about the believers that he walked with and talked with in us. How did he do that? Not a trick question, how did he do that? By how he lived and what he said. So how do we do that? By how, what we say and what we do. We also know God through his creation. Listen, y'all didn't tell the sun to move up, get on up, did you? No? Did you tell the moon to set and the stars to get up there too? When you go outside, when you're outside and you see the world, you have to just take a moment and take in the fact that it was God. And what does that mean? That he is magnificent, he is almighty, he is all-knowing, he is more than able to do anything that he desires to do because he is God. We know God, and I'm gonna move through this one really quickly, through our intimate time with him. Do you talk to him? Do you draw near to him? The Bible says if you draw near to him, he will draw near to you. How are you gonna have a relationship and know someone that you don't spend time with? You spend time with a lot of people to get to know them. The other way, by communing with him in private times of prayer. But also, can I just tell you, in eternity, we will fully know him. So you're not here on earth ever going to get to a point of arrival. You will know him fully when we see him. So now, it's just the beautiful journey of seeing how much we can know about God until we go to heaven. How beautiful is that? We can journey how much we're gonna be able to know how much he loves us until we meet him and we are undone. I don't know about y'all, but I, I get excited when I talk about heaven because heaven is our home. This is temporary. It's very interesting to me that Christians have such an issue with death. Like it brings fear. Now we've made funerals and all the things really creepy, but Death doesn't mean the same thing that it means to unbelievers for us. Death is a celebration. It is victorious. We get to, listen, people in heaven are doing way better than what we're doing. You think you striving and working hard to make your little money, like Pastor Tia said, just to leave it here and to turn to dust? They are worshiping the Father, no sickness, no struggles, no nothing. Now, I don't want to go before my time, but I'm not afraid. And I don't grieve like other people grieve. My grandmother is 90-something years old. When my grandmother goes and sees Jesus, I will, be, I will be sad that I won't see her. But I will celebrate because I know my grandma going to be with Jesus. Listen, she's a, she's a 12 handfuls, but she loves her son to Jesus. She might hurt your feelings every now and again and then say, I'm sorry, baby. And, but then she's going to pray for you. <laughs> Ain't it right? But she knows Jesus, so I will celebrate. The only reason why grief is hard is when we don't know where the people are going. That's when grief is hard. Not that you can't, not that grief isn't, a process. It is not like torturous when you don't know when the person is. Or you don't really truly believe that heaven is your home. Okay. So now we know we we know we're we know how we're gonna know God, right? Y'all feel good? Okay, now how do we then know his love? Number one, I need you to understand the biblical definition of love, okay? Love is a decision to compassionately, righteously, sacrificially seek the well-being of another. 
I'll say it again. Love is a decision to compassionately, graciously, sacrificially seek the well-being of another. How do I know that? How do you know that, Pastor Tamika? Did you look that up in the dictionary? No, I looked at Jesus. I want you to read Matthew, they put up on the screens, Matthew 9, 35 through 36. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowd, he had compassion on them because they were harassed, helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful but the workers are few. What does it mean to know, God, to know God's love? In order to love, to know God's love, we have to know his heart. So we know his heart by, number one, what he loves. What does God love? You, me, them folk. All them folk. He loves people. When I said even them, listen, I just wanna say this to you. We often say this, we often quote this, you know, Pastor Brian says, um, scripture taking out of context is actually a con. Now, we often use 1 Corinthians. Um, let me look that up real quick. First Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, the love, to talk about marriage. Love is kind, love is patient, right? But you realize that when Paul wrote that, he was writing to a body of believers. He was talking to them about how they treat each other. Did you know that? He was telling them, your love should be kind. Your love should be patient. It should not be easily angered. Because they were causing a bunch of mess. Loving even them does not mean affirm affirming things that God doesn't say in his word. We can agree to disagree. I love you enough to tell you what is true. But we can agree to, that is not gonna stop me just because we don't, we don't agree doesn't mean I'm gonna stop loving you. We end up not loving people because we don't agree with them. I don't even denominationally have to agree with you. I have friends who are Baptists, I have, I, you know, I have people in my life that there are different things in the Bible that we may not necessarily see eye. That doesn't mean that I don't love them. We cancel people and don't love them anymore on the, the smallest, most insignificant things. Where Jesus didn't demonstrate that. Show me in the scriptures where Jesus said, cut those folks off when they hurt your feelings. I'm not talking about abuse, okay? Don't get it twisted. But somebody not agreeing with you, you getting into a, a, you know, a debate about something, you see something differently, and then you attract your love from them? How do we know God's love? He, what he loves, people, even them, even me. Guys, we have to do better. We have to really start like Ephesians 3.19. Paul said, really pray that we are rooted and established in his love. Many of us live such teeter-totter lives. And I get it, you're growing. But there's a certain point where you get old and you're like, that's enough. I'm not doing that mess no more. There was even a point when I didn't even have enough sense that the Holy Spirit helped me to say, that's enough. I am not doing that no, no more. I'm just not. 
I am, there is no, I am no longer going to allow the enemy to tell me I'm not worthy. When God has overly, Sunday after Sunday, scripture after scripture, sending ministering angels close as people to minister to me, to tell me that I'm worthy. Enough is enough. I am who he says I am. I don't qualify, but he's not requiring me because he sent his son Jesus who did. How do we know God's love? And I'm closing. I mean, but what does it mean to know God's love? Sorry. To share his love. Listen, this whole message is not just about you. It is. But it's about others, too. The weight of God's redemptive message is on us. I say this all the time. Jesus did what he's going to do. He is making intercession for you. He sent the Holy Spirit and he died. Jesus is not coming back to tell your cousin, who's a gangbanger, that he loves him. He, made, he sends you. He sends me. He sends other believers who know it, who are rooted in it, who have an awareness of it, who are growing in the understanding of it, to share that. So when we share God's love and represent as God's love, we then know his love. Lastly, we're obedient to the word. First John 2, 5, but if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him, that we do, this is me, that's not the scripture, but we do what he says we are supposed to do. Doesn't it sound simple? I know it's not always simple. I know sometimes it can be challenging, but it is the way. And you don't have to do it alone. The Holy Spirit is there as your advocate, your counselor to help you. I want to pray for you. I have more, but I want to close. I want to do want to give you some homework. I want you over the next 30 days I want you to read over the Gospels. I want you to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and see what Jesus did, what he said. Jesus was fully known and fully loved so that you could be fully known and fully loved, so that you could fully know and fully love others. But you got to do that by getting in the Word and knowing it. I can't do that for you. I'd love to, I'll pray for you, but you have to take that journey on your own with the Father. So read through the Gospels, and then I want you to pray Ephesians 3, 14 over yourself, that you would know the love of the Father beyond your natural understanding, the height, the width, the depth, the length, of his love. Amen. Did you hear something from God today? I'm not looking for a hand clap. I just want to know that you received something from God. My applause come when I see him in heaven. When he says, well done. Those are the only applause that I'm waiting for. Listen, I want to pray for you. Listen, if there's anybody in the room that you just listen, you've been beat up by this world and there has been such a bombardment from the enemy of the whispers and the lies that God doesn't love you, you're not worthy, there have been people in your family, there have been situations, 
all the things. You remember every one of your sins. And you're saved, but you still hold yourself. I want to pray for you. I want to pray with you. I want the prayer team to come. I want to pray. If that's you, listen, there is no, listen, everybody stand up. I want you to stand up. I don't want you to feel any, listen, this message was for me. Like, I just, I was even at bear, and I woke up this morning, and I still feel like, I don't know if God really loves me. Does he really know me? I don't know. And then there are some of you, and we're going to pray for all of you at the same time, that the greatest knowing that you could do is to know Jesus died, rose, bought your sins so that you don't have to live a life where the enemy can beat you up about your sins because then you know that your sins have been forgiven. I want you to all to close your eyes and if that's you, listen, I, I love you and I want you to have an encounter with God. I didn't preach this to fuss at you, but to just le realign us to the heart of the Father so that we really truly can be Nikeo, a place where we know God and live out his heart. So if number one, it's you, like I just need somebody to pray some with me because I'm really struggling and I wanna know God. I want to know his love and I wanna know that he fully knows me and fully loves me. That's you, I, wanna, I want you to make your way to the altar. Every eye closed, I, nobody's looking, you go. Come, come, come on. I know you're in here. I know there's a bunch of you in here. Men, don't allow your pride to get in the way. You are a son of God. He loves you. He doesn't need you to be a, a man, a strong man. This isn't just a woman thing. This is a man thing too. So don't let your pride get in the way. I need to know God's love. I'm a man, but... I need to know love because I need to know how to love my family. I need to know how to love my kids. And if the other one of you is like, I don't know, I don't, I didn't know that Jesus died so that I could live. I don't know that he's, God sent his son and that was the kind of love that was available to me. And could someone just lead me in a prayer then I know that I'm saved, that I can receive the love that God has for me through salvation? If that's you, I want you to come. Even if you're messed up and you need a, just like a reset. I know there's, there's at least two of you I know. The Lord told me. Don't be ashamed. Every eye closed. That's you. You can move. We just want to pray with you. Thank you, Lord. This is the presence of God is in this room. This is not emotion. This is the presence of God in this room. Lord, we thank you. Can y'all pray with your eyes closed? Can you pray for everybody that's here? Can you pray for yourself? Lord, I want to know you. I want to know your love. Y'all start singing. 
Come on, lift up your voice. He loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves Make it personal. He loves me. He loves me. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves me. Some of you just need to lift your hands and receive the Father's love. He loves me. Oh. time he loves every voice me. lifted come on oh how he loves me oh how he loves me oh how he There's ministry happening in the altar. We're not going to move. The presence of God is here. He really wants to deposit something in you. And if you just open up your, your hands and your heart, you're going to feel different when you leave. Say, Lord, I want to know you. Not the way I think I know you, but I want to know you in the fullness of who you are. I want to experience your love and the fullness of it. Not the way I conceive of it, not the way my family and people have talked about it, but God, I want to have a genuine encounter with you this week. As I sleep, Father, whisper to me, love on me oh god overwhelm me with your love father and i promise that i will share that love with other people because freely it was given and freely i'll give freely it was given to me and freely i'll give nikeo church i'm so glad that you came to church today are you glad you came to church today May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord lift up his countenance to you. Be gracious to you. Lavish you with his love and give you peace. You are dismissed. Listen, have an amazing Sunday. I love you, ladies. I love you guys. Have a great Sunday. We'll see you next week. Oh, how he 